artists. Different types of evil them a study. I see my just saved on the food them a way to them so they can use them. You need to go to a synagogue, in particular, the library of a synagogue. In every synagogue library, we find hundreds of books, but there are a few which tower above the rest in authority. These include the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, the Jewish Encyclopedia. In the oldest of these, the Jewish Encyclopedia, we encounter fascinating new perspectives on the inner teachings of Judaism, perspectives which are well known to most religious Jews, but unknown to Christians. Most Christ also called the Pharisees adulterers, an adulterous generation. The Talmud provides generous loopholes for adultery. It says the penalty for adultery does not include sex with a minor, the wife of a minor, or the wife of a heathen. The Talmud also encourages seduction of unwed adolescent girls called designated bondmaids. But it's important how such rapes are performed. With the designated bondmaid, one is guilty only in the case of natural connection, but not in the case of perverse connection. The Pharisees reason that rape in a perverted manner is outside the jurisdiction of the law. Normal rape, however, was punishable. In Babylon, sexual perversion of every kind had been a way of life for millenniums. The Pharisees were deeply influenced by such practices. In three of the major treatises of the Talmud are found extensive passages which give legal endorsement to seduce and marry three-year-old baby girls. In fact, many of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, including Simeon ben Yohai, upheld this privilege. Today in Israel, thousands of Jews go to Meron every year to venerate the memory of Simeon ben Yohai, one of the most respected rabbis in the history of Judaism. In one of dozens of endorsements of child sex, Simeon ben Yohai said, a proselyte under the age of three years and a day is permitted to marry a priest Agreeing with Ben Yohai, the great Rabba said, When a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. For when the girl is less than this, three years and a day, it is as if one put the finger into the eye. The footnote to this passage says, As tears come to the eye again and again, so does virginity come back to the little girl under three years. The same section confirms that sexual activity with small boys is in the same category. The intercourse of a small boy is not regarded as a sexual act. This is considered in the society today evil. Sexual relations between an adult and a child, this is considered a crime known as pedophilia. However, we should note that this accusation is a false accusation. In our times, the idea of a nine-year-old being considered a woman might seem very strange. We have girls who reach the age of 20, and they're still girls. They don't know how to wash, iron, you know, do the things of a home, take care of a home. They don't know how, because they're raised pampered. So in such a society, the idea of, you know, somebody who was nine years old getting married, this is definitely strange, if not evil in their view. But the reality is that you're talking about 1,400 years ago. In a world, wherever you went in the world, people who were young at that age were getting married. This is not something strange. If you go back and look at the rulers in Europe, in Asia, wherever you went in the world, you will find that 1,400 years ago, people married, quote unquote, children. And then we have to question, what is pedophilia? Is pedophilia marriage? Those people who are involved in the crime of pedophilia, what are they doing? They are going to third world countries, poor countries, where people are desperate 
and they are buying these children and abusing them sexually. They're not talking about marriage. They're not going there and marrying anybody. They're just abusing them. This is pedophilia. Marriage is a whole other thing. Marriage is an institution. Marriage is honor. There is honor there. A person's honor is protected. And then again, if one were to ask the West, so at what age should people be married? Well, they have different numbers. In fact, if we look at the statistics concerning Europe, for what they call consensual sex, means a female may have sexual relations at this age and her consent is sufficient. It's not considered to be rape or anything else, pedophilia or anything else. Right? Not talking about marriage now, they're just saying she can have sexual relations freely at this age. In England, it's 18. In France, it's 17. In Germany, it's 16. In Italy, it's 14. In Holland, it's 12. So then what is the age? What number are we going to use? These are just arbitrary numbers they've just thrown around. So what is considered a crime in one country is considered perfectly legal in another. And this is within the European Union itself. What Islam has prescribed here is puberty. This is a real dividing line. When a girl becomes a woman. A little woman, but still a woman. This is God's sign in what we call nature, showing that she is now capable of bearing child. So, there is nothing wrong with it, nothing we should be ashamed about. Young women need to know and young men need to know that if parents refuse, they have the right to go to the Qadi, the Muslim judge, or the Muslim Imam, the head of the community, and have the authority of the father taken away, where the Imam can now stand as the Wali for the one whose Wali is, in, or whose Wilaya is invalid, invalidated by their refusal to marry uh, young people because of un-Islamic reasons. الزواج قسمة القسمة الأولاني عقد قران إجراء عقد قران هذا شيء والبناء يعني الدخول على الزوجة هذا موضوع آخر فأما إجراء العقد فهذا أمر يعني ليس له سن معينة في في إجراء العقد يعقد على حتى يمكن أن يعقد على على فتاة عمرها سنة زمان مش تسع سنين ولا سبع سنين ولا ثمانية سنين هذا مجرد عقد إيجاب وقبين هل هي هل الفتاة أو البنت محل للدخول أم لا طبعا وكم سن الدخول المناسب في بعض الدول أصدر القوانين أن لا يتم الدخول إلا بعد 18 عام ولنا في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قد حسنة حيث عقد على زوجته عائشة وكان سنها ست سنوات وبنى عليها يعني دخل عليها صلى الله عليه وسلم تسع سنوات ست سنوات لا عقد عليها وهي ستة وتزوجها العقد في ستة والبناء اللي هو الدخول في تسع سنوات ولنا في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم أسوة حسنة بس خلي خلي أوضح لك وما قال أن الناس كلهم ذهاب كاسرة اللي بهذه التصنيفة اللي أنا بقولها لك التمتع بالمفاخذة عندهم التمتع بالملامسة زين التمتع بالمكعبة التمتع بالصغيرة التمتع بالصغيرة تعرف شنو معناتها؟ معناتها يتمتعون بالطفل اللي عمرها سنتين ثلاث سنين اربع سنين عشان ما ندخل بس في تفصيلات التمتع بالمفاخذه خلاص اشرح لك شنو هم لا 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 هذه ضد حقوق الطفل هذه يعتبر هذه يعتبر اعتداء جنسي على الطفله 
يعني المت... التم... التمتع بالمفاخذه شنو هو دي؟ التمتع بالرضيعه معناته دي زين الرضيعه يعني كم عمرها؟ طيب. سنه سنه ونص اشهر بس... يعني هل يعقل؟ هل يعقل؟ رجل بالغ يمارس الجنس مع طفل رضيعة وتقولون بالشريعة الإسلامية أحلت هذه الأمور. Under fire for marrying an Egyptian girl alleged to be 13 years old, 49-year-old Nigerian senator Ahmed Sani Yaruma. He paid 100,000 US dollars as dowry for the girl. This is his defense. Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم married Sina Aisha Ridala Ana at the age of nine. Therefore. Any Muslim who marries a girl of nine years and above is following the teachings and practice of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you have a law that says you cannot marry a 13-year-old, a law that says you cannot marry a 15-year-old, then why on God's green earth would a guy who's a senator who makes laws violate or break that same law? It's because he thinks the law is not applicable to him. It's an absolutely horrific story. Uh, a girl, 12 years old, her name is Fauzia Amudi. Uh, she was living in Hadeda province in Yemen. Uh, she was forcibly married uh, last year to a man twice her age, and she was 11 years old. She was then taken out of school, then became pregnant. Uh, we got all these details from Ahmed al Qurashi, who is uh, with a child's right organization in Yemen. He actually brought this case to the media's attention. Uh, this girl started going into labor last week. Um, she's in a remote province of Yemen. It was very difficult for an ambulance to reach her, according to Al-Qurashi. An ambulance reached her the next day, the second day when she was in labor. It was very, very complicated. Finally, she got to a hospital that day, and then the third day, when she was still in labor, she bled to death, and the child was still born. It sometimes takes the case of just one to shed light on the suffering of so many. A child's rights group says that a Yemeni child bride, Fawzia Amadi, labored for three days before dying along with her baby on Friday. She was just 12. She was married at 11, a practice all too common in the tribal region of western Yemen, where she's from. These vulnerable newborns are one step closer to survival by receiving the specialized care that's all too rare in Yemen. These compromised young lives are many times the offspring of children. Bedsides throughout the maternity ward in Yemen's capital, Sana, there are stories of girls too young to have children who die trying. This man tells us of a girl he found in the middle of the road in his village, desperate and in labor. She died, and after she died, the baby died. She was walking a long way and she died on the road without making it to hospital. In a highly publicized case, Najib demanded and received a divorce. She is now back with her family. Her... I don't think you must have read the report. That's what I, 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 I looked at the report, and I looked at what I found in there, and I found that lack of attachment and affection yeah. and inadequate heating and being kicked are considered and kissing an inappropriate sexual talk. So, oh, excuse me, so, so you, don't, you, don't, you don't believe that there's something grossly offensive and obscene about an adult member of a religious order kissing a prepubescent child? Let me give you some of the evidence, for instance, now Mr. Dunne, who's seen it, you've asked for it. We'll talk about the implements used in physical abuses found by the inquiry. In addition, and I'm quoting directly, uh, page 57 of uh, the report of the Confidential Commission, section 7.20. In addition to physical abuse as a result of bodily assaults by punching, hitting and kicking, uh, there were reported a variety of implements being used to beat and physically abuse residents. The leather was the most commonly reported implement. Uh, witnesses described the leather strap as strips of leather sewn together, measured about two inches wide, half an inch thick and about 18 inches long. One end was described as a number of witnesses as shaped for a hand grip. They reported that some of these le leather straps contained metal or coins to add weight. Uh, accounts were provided of either making or seeing these embellished leather straps being made in the boot-making workshop. So the children were forced to make the implements that were then used to beat and torture them. Ritualized beatings. It talks about not the actions of a few individuals, but a system that used ritualized beatings and physical assaults that were criminal at the time, that remain criminal today, and that were not corporal punishment, that were beyond the bounds of corporal punishment. It found that the sexual abuse of boys in, in religious-run institutions, Catholic church institutions, was endemic 
It found that the church understood the recidivist nature of child sexual abuse, that they knew that these men would reoffend, but that they simply moved them from institution to institution. And when they had to act to lay aside, they lay aside them and allowed them to become lay teachers, where they continued to abuse, often for very many decades, despite the pre-existing knowledge of the congregations and of the church. That's what this report has found. That's the evidence of a judicial inquiry found as evidence of fact uh, before a high court judge in this country. The report. Frankly, frankly, um, I believe that if we found five cases of rape that were known to the Catholic Church here in Ireland, that were covered up, that were denied, that were colluded with, where children were blamed for having spoken, spoken out, where children who were raped when they spoke were beaten, that would be reason enough for the kind of outrage that's being expressed in this country and across the world. And the way we saw it was... It took a man and a woman to come together to produce a child. So it would take a god and a goddess to come together to produce the likeness of the universe. Yeah. That just made sense to us. We saw God as black because we were the first people on planet Earth. Won't nobody else here but us. So how would that word God gonna be but black? And we made a decision. We knew that the creative force in the universe had positive and negative energy. Everything is, you know, the opposites. But we chose to make the decision that the way we identify the creators was good. And so that's what we wanted to focus on, the good side. So we, we said the creator is benevolent and good. Now the European, if you go a thousand years ago, had no concept of God whatsoever. The closest thing they had to a concept of God, we'll deal with it a little bit later, but it's a Satan concept. We'll get there, just hang with me just a little bit longer. Black women perceived and valued by black men and perceived as the black man's complimentary partner in the journey of life. The way our African ancestors saw brothers and sisters was that God so loved the woman, the black woman, that he honored her with the privilege of being able to bring forth life. And consequently, that meant not only was she special, but she had a special relationship with the Creator. And since she had this special relationship with the Creator, that's the, 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 that's the way we envisioned and saw her as special. And so we were honored by the fact that God would give us this beautiful woman to be able to bring forth life. White females are hated for producing more miles for Caucasian males to feed, and they are viewed as sexual objects. Walk with me, this is a dirty walk, but walk with me to the caves and hills of Europe, brother. <laughs> Just for a minute. Put your boots on, brother. See, the white male, he was living in a cold, harsh climate. He might eat once every two or three weeks. Life was difficult in that cave. He didn't have no fire, he didn't have no uh, aqueducts, nothing to do with water. He was living on a barbarian level. So when he ran out and caught that wild rabbit, he had a fight right into it, right in the sea. He didn't have no fire, the blood dripping down the side of his face. And he had to run back home to this female, try to feed her if he was gonna feed her. And so that's the kind of life he was living. And so he noticed that this female did this real tricky thing. For him to have this pleasurable thing, he would have this thing called sex. But what he noticed is, about nine months later, she popped up with this thing in her belly. And all of a sudden, there was an additional mouth for him to feed. So he said, that's a real evil trick she's playing on me because I already can't feed myself. She ain't coming out here to help me hunt. And now I got to hunt for this little thing coming out of her belly. So he developed a deep, sick hatred for the white female in addition to just his nature. Black men are loved and appreciated by black women, and we are perceived as the black woman's complimentary partner in the journey of life. If you go back thousands of years, when the black woman looked at the black man, like, almost like she would look at God in the sense that God put this stuff here on the planet for us, everything we need to survive. And she said, you know what, the black man, the, man, the black man is just like that. If there's fruit that needs to be planted, if there's a threat that comes in this community, Who's going to go out there and face that threat in a selfless manner with no regard for his own life to black men? If, if, if we need to move to a new level of civilization, come up with new concepts, who's going to figure those things out and do it for us? If we see drought and famine coming, who's going to tell us the right direction to go, take us there, and ward off any threats in the process? If there's going to be a beautiful, bright future, who'll take us there? It was always the black man. So the black woman had a deep loyalty and love for the black man because we were committed to one another. White males were feared and hated for their physical abuse of white females, but heavily relied upon uh, to provide for their family. So it was a dichotomous relationship because though she hated the physical abuse she would get from the white male when he came to that cave, he also brought food there too. So she had a way on both sides.